Live tonight from the virtual Atlanta Motor Speedway, we say good evening, sim racing fans, and welcome to RaceBot TV's coverage of the 2020 Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series, powered by Boosted. As always, happy that you're with us at RaceBot TV. We're alongside Justin Prince, my name's Evan Pasoko. Downstairs, our producer Connery Maddock is bringing us to you for round number three of the 2020 campaign. As we get set to say, let's go racing for the boosted. Absolutely, Evan. This is going to be an entertaining one because, yes, it's a mile and a half circuit just above that mark at 1.54 miles. However, it's a hot race track, known for its temperatures. It's on the cooler side for many of these competitors tonight. But even with that, the tire and temperature swings can be so drastic. The fall off up to two seconds at this racetrack at the very minimum. It could come down to tire management by the end of the race. That's certainly going to be the biggest scene because in this race, as we take a look, practice just winding down, drivers getting set to go for their two-lap single-car qualifying session. But I mean, in the practice session, Justin, the fastest car and the slowest car separated in just a half a second as we get set for this race in Atlanta. First one-and-a-half miler on the year. So off of the top, it is a fixed setup series. Yes, it looks like there's a lot of parity throughout the field, but as you mentioned, those tires are, I think, even though 125 laps is not going to be a marathon by any stretch of the imagination, it is going to be the tires ever so critical and an abrasive race like this in Atlanta, but also first time seeing these cars with this specific 2020 package on an intermediate look the next two weeks homestead texas we've got three in a row on these one and a half milers yeah all the races in this stretch have a lot of potential unknowns with atlanta potentially with drivers blowing out tires especially right fronts at this circuit homestead miami also a fun race track but also a track with a hot amount of tire wear and texas don't forget there's a new version of that for Texas on the iRacing service with that change banking in turns one and two. So that leaves it unknown for that race. So these next three events on the calendar can bring a lot of question marks that are going to be answered once they take the green flag. Of course, this is the point in the season last year where we started to see Andrew Fridage kind of take a stranglehold on things. But as you take a look at the championship standings headed into this evening, it is Malik Ray who is on the top of the pile. That courtesy of a race win last week out took the checkered flag in Fontana. He and Adam Benefiel are two race winners so far this season. Benefiel, though, did not start last week. He missed it. So therefore, for him, he falls down to what would be 12th there or so in the championship standing so not a very good position for benefit to be in tight for 13th actually there on the right hand side of your screen so two different races two different race winners none of which are the two-time defending champion in freedage every year in this cup series we see some new faces come in bring some life at the start of the year and even last season justin that was no different but as we start to now work into a couple of weeks into the season we're gonna have to see if freedage is gonna step up or if that pure period of dominance that he has reigned supreme over seemingly all RSR competition for the last two years may be in threat. Yeah, that's the thing though. These are the types of races coming up this week, Homestead, Texas, where it's kind of always been in his ballpark as a driver. However, this season, he just has not had the same amount of luck as we've seen compared to last campaigns. Had some ups and downs at Daytona had a very down point by trying to start near the back of the field at Auto Club. So this is a track today where, if I'm Andrew, you're thinking you need a good finish. He already put in tons of practice time, for example, in those times you mentioned. It's going to be curious, though, who put in the best amount of work for this racetrack tonight. If Fridaj was actually sixth slowest in practice, but we have come to learn that he is not really somebody who goes out there and hot laps it. When we say he practices, I mean, he'll go out and do at minimum a fuel run, if not more than that, entire race runs. And it may not necessarily be in the practice session before the race. All these drivers get 80 minutes before qualifying every single week. But even over the course of the week, when we're not racing an opportunity to get into a position to get tons of practice in, uh, so 
is certainly coming into this one prepared. Yeah, absolutely. There's been entire times with Andrew Freenosh in his specific case. He's ran entire races before even taking the green flag to the one that counts for points. But this is a track tonight here, Evan, where track position is paramount. It's going to be curious to see how he does tonight. He was not a driver who put a qualifying time. Well, that qualifying session has drawn to a close, so let's go trackside and take a look at tonight's Race Spot TV starting grid. It will be Joseph Tice on pole position, runner up from just a week ago. He'll bring us to the green flag at his 29 801 best of them all, and he'll be joined by Sam Nieto rolling from second position. Michael Lariah therefore pits up the number three spot into qualifying. He's joined by Scott McClendon on the outside of road 2P4. Both of them just ahead of the 24 Chevy of Grant Davis, who runs in fifth. Jared Mogart starts in the sixth position tonight in the double zeros machine, while Bradley Burke starts in run number four alongside Liam Sheen. Brett McBride starts in ninth in the iRacing flag machine, with John Rodden rounding out the top ten. Dean Parrish will roll from 11th spot with Chris Parkman in the number 12 position. Blake O'Connell gets 13th. Colby Buck alongside in the number 14 spot. You got Kalist back in 15th. Bobby Chaney rolls from 16th with Michael Bozier 17th. Gary Sexton is P18. That's halfway home to Eric Stanford and Jonathan Cadell who make up row 10. James Pascarella starts in 21st position, just one one thousandth of a second separated to his roaming, and Adam Benefield starting deep in the field in 22nd. David Washington starts in 23rd with Kyle Trudell in 24th. In the following row, Nicholas Caldwell having to start alongside the first driver in the 30s and RJ Williams. Thomas George and Daniel Scott start in 27th and 28th, while rounding out the top 30, Daniel Eberhardt and Michael Kuczynski. Just behind them, Adam Pellegrini, or Andrew Pellegrini, I should say, going to go 31 with Anthony Emery, 32nd, Trevor Valderrama, 33rd, Steve Sella, 34th. The final time it qualified will go to Tom Morano, P35. Rest our provisionals. Andrew Ferdinand starting in the back. He'll be in P38. Only he, Jeremy Rittenberg, and Steve Durham are the drivers who go based on provisionals. So a wide majority of the field deciding to qualify in this one. They call it hot Atlanta. It is an overcast conditions, but we're still looking at 120 plus degrees. Track temps as we get set to go racing on the 1.54 mile intermediate racetrack, 24 degrees of banking, and an old asphalt surface gives this racetrack its name. Yeah, it's a track with a ton of tire wear. We've hit upon it a couple of times. Expecting at least two seconds of fall off throughout the run. And there's the chance that if you push too hard, there's a chance that, yes, you'll be having some good speed on that preferred line at the start of the race, but you'll drop back quickly. Clean air also going to be very important, Evan, so it's going to become the question, can Joseph Tice take advantage of the clean air and pull away? The sun's going to come out just in time, as always. So happy that you're spending your Monday night with us here on Race Spot TV. The pace car dives down and in, and it is going to be the number one Chevrolet from Paul. Joseph Tice going to bring it to, as we say, let's go racing from Atlanta. Round three underway. And a nice clean launch at the front of the field. A couple of drivers got a bit slower at the back. But Tice already under attack. Lorio looking to make a push. He'll dive right to the inside, so the one car is going to hold the top. You can say side by side throughout most of the field right now as Lorio struggles at the bottom line. You can see Tice going to move up and give him some room there as he works on a technical issue. Uh, but the one machine in front right now as now Lorio on the bottom gets a nose in front. Yeah, Lorio's looked pretty impressive throughout this season so far. And if you want to go through the field, the one thing you have to do is you have to get to the bottom. That time he did be able to make the move, and Tice already knows that he wants it back. Yeah, real quick crossover. He'll go back down to the inside as the top two 
actually pull a little bit of distance this time at a turn four. Joseph Tice from pole leads his first lap that time through an advantage at just one one hundredth of a second. You can see all the fun in on the wide shot there. Tons of two wide throughout at least the top ten or so as Tice now clears it for the race lead. Last season this race was also a 125 lap contest. We saw four different leaders, six lead changes, and a total of three caution flags. Again, a race dominated by Fridage, who led 117 of those 125 laps. But as he's back in the pack, he's not going to be doing that early in this one. You're on board with Scott McClendon. Started fourth, but it got passed up, and he now falls to P5. And the drivers in the positions of such as McClendon have to be knowing they have to save on quarter entry. Lift off the throttle because if you burn up your tires in the first 10, 15 laps of a run, you're going to potentially fall off like a rock because here at Atlanta, this has build, especially for these drivers. You put the right front tire, you're not going to be able to have any grip caution. First caution of the night, and there is a ton of cars around. It is a big mess coming out of turn number four. And I believe we'll find it all started with R.J. Williams in the 21 machine. There is a whole host of cars in this one. And you'll see as it all unfolds, coming out of turn four, Steve So is coming out of four, not minding his own business. And there's the 21 car just stomped the racetrack all on his own. I think if we can get a look with Williams, it'll show Justin to get the left side tires on the apron. Going to bump from behind by Anthony Emery. And from there, he had no chance to hang it on to it. Yeah, this is going to be a good view right here. Keep an eye on those left side tires specifically because he's just trying to follow the car in front. Then he cradles the apron for a good full turn and checks everybody up. Nowhere for anyone else to go as soon as he gets shot up the racetrack. A tough break again for all of those cars. A lot of these drivers, you can see Michael Bozier down at the pit lane. He'll go on board with his Monster Energy Chevy. I mean, these cars did qualify, and only three drivers did not. But, you know, at the back of the back, you're expected to be rotted around, and that kind of came out of nowhere. Absolutely no way that Bozier was going to be able to avoid that one. But some drivers, Justin, made some good escapes. Yeah, Andrew Freenosh had the best save, I think, out of anyone in the 88 machine. Again, our two time defending champion. We can take a look because you see on the back of the opening views where he's running on the bottom line, sees what's happening, then right here has to cut the wheel hard to the right and is able to just stabilize it up before it bounces its way towards the wall or snaps. What a save to avoid some of those cars. That could have certainly been disastrous. A lot of drivers, uh, you know, in, in non-plate races want to stay to the back to avoid incidents, but really just to not have to deal with it. As you can see, a ton of cars in a pit lane this time, but the risk of not qualifying is exactly that, that you may be in the back if there's a mess. Race off of the pit lane, Joseph Tice stays number one of that group, despite the fact that we only went four laps before the caution of flying came out. Tice did opt to go uh, for four tires and a fuel, I should say. Uh, but it looks like everybody else, the majority of the cars behind did. But some stayed out. We have Michael Loria and Colby Buck, who have assumed first and second a position. No guarantee, Justin, that they're actually going to stay out and not eventually come down to the pit lane. Uh, Loria did grab a bonus point for staying out the last time by. Only two bonus points available, leading a lap and leading the most. So that may be all the 44 wanted. We'll see, though, if they opt to come in. Well, you have to remember, though, well, Rai actually led the first lap of this race on the track, and I think they're both going to gamble here. Them and Kobe Buck might want track position. Here's the problem with that thought process. It's not the track where you want to really risk staying on old tires, Evan, because not just the matter of tire spin can come into play. Just four laps difference can be about a half a tenth to a full tenth a lap off or so, these cars might be potentially passed pretty quickly in about three, four laps, if not in the next 10. And it is a little bit more of a gamble, I would say, for Loria here, because you mentioned he had been up at the front to begin with. If you're Colby Buck, you started 14th. So if you drop a dozen spots, 
really don't lose that much. Again, a two-lap difference on the tires ain't a ton, but at uh, Atlanta, not the racetrack that I would uh, gamble with tires, as you mentioned, right off the get-go. But listen, he's got some wiggle room. If you're Lariah, I mean, you're already up there battling for the race lead, so you drop one spot. It's already a loss. Of course, his concern probably was, hey, if I pit and, you know, the back half of the field does it, I could have ended up in the teens and 20s. Instead, those are the only two side-by-side -side on the front row who decided not to come down to the pit lane. Uh, so we'll see. No tires. Lariah Ryan and Buck, four and a fuel for most everybody else on back. Williams involved in the incident. That car's gone behind the wall. A couple on the pit lane for repairs. A restart up with 32 cars still on the lead lap. Green flag in the air, and it is a great jump for the 44, but it dies out a little bit on the gear shift there. Buck now tucks in behind. Played out very well by the first two drivers, and already they got the preferred line, but here's the thing. Tyson's has made it clear he's not afraid to fight very early, even though the Flano Motorsports machine may burn up some of the rubber. He's been wanting track position from the get-go. One second now. He does, and he gets down to the bottom lane. The one at Tice is going to be able to get around. Colby Buck, yes, sir, back into second. And you can hit the reset button now because we're playing for the race lead where it was at the completion of lap number one. Loria leads Tice. Buck now third, under attack by Scott McClendon, side by side, and at turn number two. Pretty much drag race down the back straight away. Hard to give an advantage to either lane. A little bit of more speed on the buck at the top end. The 22 car evens it up on entry. And been a slow start for McClendon this season. Has not been too much of a talking point. But this has been a stellar start in these first 10, 11 laps of this race. Having some decent pace early on here in Atlanta. All the way up to that third position. Here's the thing though. I think Buck's got a problem because if you lose the bottom here, Evan, at all, you get the risk of being freight trained by everybody else, and he's in that risk of doing so. He's struggling even Arca down. Yeah, with the 22 and around of it was just that, but you can see the freight train led by Sam Nieto. He gets his number two for the bus dang to the bottom. And if he's able to complete this pass, yes, he does in one. There's a whole host of other drivers. Grant Davis next on deck. He'll go to the bottom. You got Burke, Sheen all lined up. Mogard, McBride, all of these drivers. Great lockstep with this as they want to keep him honest. And it could be a long way for the 34 before he finds a spot back on the inside. Again, started 14th spot. We'll see how far he drops if he can't get down in line. Yeah, this has got to be a major concern for him. And again, he's got to wait for the first opening to get down. He's also got that disadvantage. So it's going to be tough sledding for him. Already, though, Tice up in the lead at this point. And he's already pulling away by about a tenth of a second. Oh, as contact! contact! Colby Buck is into the fence. Somebody else is involved. And a second yellow of the night out of nowhere after he got into it with Liam Sheen. Big incident for the 52 car who went up and over, but it was really a problem with Colby Buck, who on his own, he scrapes the wall. You can see this is the second half of it. Basically, I think Buck caught the fence going into three, got sideways, came down and tagged to Sheen. It was a monster wreck for Sheen. The onboard with Buck here going to tell the tale of the tape. And it's so easy to clip that safer barrier right there in turn three. That's exactly what Buck did. You're following along all the drivers in front of you, and then you just sometimes go too high alongside that outside wall and forget, oh, hey, if you don't turn in early enough, you clip that safer barrier. That's exactly what he did. Just didn't realize it was there. So an unfortunate incident, as you can see, Sheen way up and into the air. His night basically done at that point. You can see the black smoke engine gone on that. No quick repairs in this real Serenity to Full Throttle Cup Series. And as expected, a very quick claim as the cause of the incident uh, by Colby Buck there. Race later, so back down pit road. They all go for four again. And that's to be expected, but again, some gambles of some of the drivers, some of them maybe to get an extra lap of repairs. However, Tice McClendon Nieto didn't join any of the other cars we see down this lane.
Yeah, so a split decision, as you can see, here's the race off of Pit Road. Some three wide, a few rows back, but the leader off of the pit lane is going to be Michael Lariah. So the 44 did opt to come down this time through, and uh, in all of the chaos, I believe uh, Colby Buck as well uh, is going to be forced down to the pit lane for damage repair. He was the second of the two cars uh, that had stayed out. So this time, the gamblers are Joseph Tice, Scott McClendon, and Sam Nieto. Three is a pair of these drivers up front, and we'll go from that pair to a trio of drivers. It didn't look horrible the last time through again. I mean, Michael Lariah was doing all right at the time of the caution fly that came out at lap number 13. He had just fallen to second after Tice got around him. So, I mean, there isn't a huge lack of speed in the uh, you know the staying out strategy but it certainly wasn't enough to contend with the four tire cars uh, so we'll see how well this second group can fare yeah i'm curious to see how this all goes here and i think again the main thing that's influencing all these decisions even at track like atlanta again is clean air has been king at this track with the 2020 regulations you're in dirty air for more than five laps you cook all your tires, and it's very difficult to make a pass unless you save aggressively. So they know that there's the possibility that if they can hold on, they can potentially have a massive gain. I'm surprised, though, that all three of these drivers did this because these were three drivers who I think had have top five, five speed in this race and were basically all along around the top five. Curious call. We'll see. Again, you would expect, as you mentioned, it maybe to be a driver. Uh, you know, that's why the Colby Bunk situation really didn't shock me all that much because that's kind of who I would expect to make the call uh, in this circumstance. Uh, we also mentioned off at the top when we were talking about the importance of this race. Um, Atlanta was round two on our full throttle calendar last season. This year falls for three. And there are a little bit of differences between this package and what we saw last season, but for all intents and purposes, uh, it is the same as the lights go on a top and pace car. And as I mentioned, that race had only four cars to flag. So, uh, you know, this has been a racetrack where we haven't been as concerned about the package and more so drivers trying to figure it out in and around each other of the way that it plays out. Certainly, uh, we'll see uh, because early on in this one, uh, the incidents uh, have been kind of strange. I mean, I wouldn't attribute either of those incidents, Justin, uh, you know, to the package. I would say that it's, you know, one driver getting down onto the apron, which happens all the time, but Atlanta and the other driver catching that safer barrier down the back straightaway. So, you know, we'll see if they can kind of shake things out because I'm really looking forward if we can get a long run uh, to seeing how it plays out. I'm curious to see how it goes, too, at this point on the racetrack and... You're right, it's been some weird ones that have all just, I think, mainly been driver error. So I'm curious to see if how these drivers react on the long run. Mind you too here, Evan, there's been these massive track temperature swings because of the most quality skies. So these drivers have, have, to, have had to be very adaptable to these conditions since the start. And that's only going to continue tonight as it continues to come in and out of daylight and the clouds as pace cars off it in. Ty's going to hold the map bay a little bit longer. Green flag back in the air. 17 laps complete so far in Atlanta. And our good start for Tice again to control that bottom. But as we've seen, the draft has been pretty significant down the back straightaway for a possible run to get to the inside line. Oh, honey, some major defense. Hey, you can see the two car in Yeto. He'll go down to the bottom line. It'll put him inside with Tyus. And look at McClendon on his zone. I thought he had a ton of speed. But that race car washed too high up the hill. He'll actually lose a little bit of track position. As the 24 to Grant Davis right up alongside him now. Going to get nose to nose. They'll race off at a turn one. Looking to the inside. A yellow behind. Caution flag is out. There's a big wreck now in one. Oh, and Andrew's two. in it. And Andrew Freenosh is in it. This was another incident involving driver error in one and two here, Evan. Where one driver, I think, arc it down into another one. I believe it was per Gary Sexton who had the best view of what happened because Shane Parrish came down and hit Benefield. Yeah, Adam Benefield was on the inside of a side-by-side -side fight between he and Eric Stanford. And I don't know if Shane Parrish just didn't see him down there.
or thought that he was clear of the 81 machine certainly comes down tags Benefield and he goes up into Stanford and it is always again the bystander cars behind who really make it a big calamity watch that bright green car up top as they'll go into turn one yeah and you can see the reason why I said Gary Sexton had the best view you can see he watches right there he just darks it right into the quarter panel of Benefield thinking I guess he was going to be lower and turns around a couple cars in the process. Mind you, Andrew Freenosh got demolished on the apron in that Benefield completely destroyed. From a tough break, we mentioned that these restarts were going to be critical and now three yellows in the opening 20 laps at Atlanta Motor Speedway, not on par with what we have been seeing so far in 2019. And of course, you see all the other drivers involved in that incident, uh, trying to get a total count on it, uh, pretty difficult, but I'm also seeing damage uh, to the cars of Michael Kaczynski, maybe a little bit of damage to John Rodden, Farina, you got Trudell, Benefil, obviously, Valderrama, Pellegrini, about at least a half a dozen or more cars pick up damage. It means that we go back through the cycle once more. Pit road opens, some cars come in, uh, but it is not as much as we had seen the last couple of times through. Yeah, this is going to definitely... It takes out a lot of contenders. I know that at the very least in this one. Right now, the rough count in, for reference sake, is at least eight or nine cars who ended up getting some type of contact in that. So I'm not surprised at least we see the back part of the field take the split chance and come down the pit lane. We only ran a couple laps. Everybody else can be comfortable staying out, but it's been a wacky one here, Evan. I don't know what you're thinking at this point. It has, and Andrew uh, Pellegrini going to bring his car behind the wall. You want to talk about some teams that have had some spoiled rotten luck. Uh, that entire group at Subpar Racing uh, has had a subpar start to the season and to tonight. I mean, three of their cars were involved in the wreck, uh, the first wreck of the night, uh, with Valderrama, Mosier, and I think Vol or, uh, Pellegrini, I think, maybe being involved. They had at least three of those four cars involved in a really bad night out. Uh, a week ago, as you can see, more cars committed out of the pit lane. So uh, a handful of drivers struggling early. And again, for a lot of these incidents, I mean, you can kick yourself over it. And you can put in a qualifying effort. You can decide not to queue and stay at the back. But I mean, with the three cars in front of you, wreck, you just can't do anything about it. It's uh, just not in the cards, I guess. And uh, it certainly could be frustrating. Yeah, it's kind of the saying is, and this is from a teammate, that I've heard and I think it kind of fits in it's kind of you're going you're going and then you're jumped it's just you don't expect it to happen it can happen anytime to anyone in the field depending on how the race cycles through a couple of drivers going to drop uh, out of this one behind the wall. I mentioned Andrew Pellegrini, Adam Benefiel also going to go uh, to the back, and he will take his car behind the wall. Uh, so a couple of the drivers dropping out early in this one. Uh, looks like just him uh, and as well maybe R.J. Williams from earlier on uh, is going to uh, find himself in that position as well. Uh, but we'll see, I mean, how this thing shakes out. I mean, with the trials and tribulations, you would expect that to present opportunity to drivers to kind of sneak in and get a race win where they may not otherwise have the opportunity to do so and with Andrew Fridage who again dominated this last year you know you have a front clip on that race car as he gets out just in front of the race leaders I mean we could be looking at again maybe a potential third different race winner of the season yeah this has just been a a rough start again as we've talked about in terms of rough starts Andrew Freenosh is already down on the eight ball with no front clip at this point uh, at this point yeah this is a completely different race from I think what we were expecting coming in I think though we're eventually going to get a long run here Evan because these cars do space out a little bit into small packs once they do get around 15-20 laps in you need to get there that's the thing that is that is the thing is you have to get to that point um you know for it to uh, be possible and and that's the key early on is attrition 
Uh, we thought that the tires and the long runs were going to be the biggest factor of this one in Atlanta. This day debate come down to these short runs. We are only 23 laps in to 125 lap contest. It'll be the first time I'll like the same cars in front for restart two times in a row. Joseph Tice held them slow last time through. He's in control once more. Green flag back in the air. Oh, and Tice didn't get going. That is a huge checkup, and now they're all going to spin behind. What a mess on the restart. It was very slow. I had mentioned that for a reason because that's what Tice had done the last time. He never slowed down, I don't believe. We'll see. I'm looking at the speed for the one car, Justin. His looks consistent. I believe it may have been the two of Sam Nieto who tried to guesstimate that. Uh, from what? he's explaining it, and this is on radio he started in fourth gear Evan and when you start in fourth you kind of don't have speed to get going I think he just had a brain fade forgot he was in four trying to gas it up and Nieto wasn't expecting that and ended up having the contact and everybody just stacked up yeah, and Scott McClendon is going to apologize over the radio as well uh, for his part in that he was the second car in line on the outside and if it was a simple case of just starting in the wrong gear I mean you know how many restarts are you gonna do in your life where you don't do that and, and eventually it, it just happens um, and, and, and you know it's one of those situations where so very rarely is that gonna happen but I think that onboard shot with Grant Davis showed you how slow he was coming to the green and also it should be of note Justin only in the initial start of the race and the car on the outside not beat the race leader to the line. So once Joseph Tice started to go, I mean, he started to accelerate really slowly, but technically the two of Sam Nieto did not have to check up and wait for him. He could have gone once the one started. Again, that beating the leader to the start finish line rule is only applied in this series on the drop of the initial green flag. He opted to check up to play it safe. That caused not only the inside the check up, but the outside the check up as well. Yeah, I think the Edo, the, that's the thing, though, was, and sometimes iRacing can do this here, Evan, if you are too far ahead of the driver on the outside, on the inside, it does give you an in-sim black flag. And that might have been his original instinct, not thinking about that side, thinking about the default. And I think that's why he checked up so hard to try and at least stay, at least even, to Tice on the bottom side. So he will claim responsibility for the caution. We haven't really talked a bunch about that this evening because both of the other drivers who have claimed some cautions uh, in both uh, uh, Colby Buck, who claimed his, and in R.J. Williams, Shane Paris, some of those other incidents who have not, is if you do claim a yellow like Colby Buck did, you would receive an end of the longest line penalty. Uh, we haven't mentioned that because both of those drivers uh, were not on track on the ensuing restart after the caution flag uh, that they had just previously uh, taken it and accepted the blame for. So, you know, with all of these cars cycling through the field, Joseph Tice is going to drop to the end and get that end of the longest line penalty. There's not too many cars, though, now left because of that situation who don't have severe damage, at least minor damage. So this completely changes the complexion of this race at this point. I'm not sure what to really say at this point, Evan. It is tough. And, you know, I think that a couple of the drivers uh, that I've been talking with here under the caution flag have... Uh, it said that they're embarrassed at how their night is gone, and these aren't even drivers who are causing incidents. You can only imagine how bad somebody like a Joseph Tice feels. I mean, this is not a, a new driver. I mean, nobody in this series, you know, are rookie drivers to compete in this real race in full throttle cup series. You have to have, uh, at a minimum, a Class B oval license on iRacing. I mean, Tice finished second place last week to a Coke Series driver in Malik Gray. He is a very good driver for flat out racing, but sometimes, Stuff happens, and I think this is one of those cases, and, you know, it's not something, I mean, you, you try to go through a checklist in your head, you know, make sure you're in the right gear, make sure you're watching your speed, and watching the race star box, and all that, but uh, if you're on iRacing, I can guarantee you, you've all done it out there sometimes, it just doesn't necessarily happen to you, you know, Monday night prime time, like it did for Tyson in that situation. Yeah, indeed, at this point, as the drivers get the two-to-go signal here, uh, we've all done it. 
as drivers, so that's the thing. You sometimes have a brain fade where you're starting in third gear or fourth. Just not sure. It's just unfortunate when it happens, when it ha when it does happen. Drivers will eventually think about that at this point. And the drivers are having a pretty active discussion with each other on the radio now uh, on if they could get this one figured out. This race last year had only about 14 cars left on the lead lap, and it, uh, you know, you compare that to the 20-plus that we saw last week in Fontana. I mean, this has not been a high-attrition start to the year, but we are already looking at more than half of the field right now being scored, or just under half of the field being scored off of the lead lap. 20 lead lap cars of the 38 who started. And don't forget, a lot of those drivers have at least minor aerodynamic damage. And this is a track where you don't want aerodynamic damage, especially with this type of package, where any type of major damage, more than 10 plus seconds, can affect the straight line speed and put you down at least two miles an hour at the end of the straightaways. So there are going to be a lot of chances for some drivers we don't usually talk about here to take advantage here tonight, Evan. And the question is, who's it going to be? You know, I mean, and that's not to say, you know, I don't, I wouldn't consider Sam Nieto a driver to take advantage of that. I mean, all these guys up front for Lariah, I mean, McBride, George, Jeremy Rittenberg, I mean, Blake O'Connell, Kaczynski, these are all drivers that we've talked about quite a bit. But there are going to be some drivers who, you know, maybe average, you know, if they can get a high, uh, you know, or, you know, a high teens finish or a low 20s of a 40 car grid with the 43 cars that we've seen start in this series so far this year. You know, they would consider that a good night. So when you take X amount out of the equation, you start thinking, all right, maybe I can get a little bit more. And I think that that, uh, you know, advantage gained, it may not necessarily be so obvious. You know, we may not see that be the guy who's in victory lane, but we'll kind of do our best to look throughout the top 10, look throughout the top 15 or 20, and you could certainly see some drivers that they haven't been in the incident so far. That's the thing. You start at the back, maybe you're in some of the incidents that have happened so far. Of maybe some drivers looking for some career best results here from Atlanta. We'll try it again, though. Pace car going to go off it in. The two car in the Nice and easy this time through. Green flag back in the air as we take lap 30. A lot of drivers scrambled on that start, actually. Not able to time things up properly. But it's going to get interesting still at the front of this field. McBride is the first driver on the freshest tires in the field. Remember, the top two had previously stayed out the past couple cautions or so. They have. We've seen a lot more mixture. It was just those first two yellows where everybody but a handful of pitted since then has been a very mixed bag of cars pitted for damage. Tires and a lot of drivers stayed out. But the fight for the race lead sees the 44 of Lariah. He is trying to push hard around Sam Nieto. And in the center of one and two, he's done it. New race leader once more. Michael Lariah going to go to the point. And side by side for third is on. How about Rhett McBride? He's been quiet. He's still out of trouble. He wants to get around Grant Davis. Can't do it. Yeah, I think the thing is, though, he might be actually saving a little bit because you do potentially lose time with the side draft down the straightaways by fighting too hard. So he might be thinking big picture here. Just try and let off the throttle right about there. Then slowly get back into an apex off and then you'll be good to make these same types of passes in a couple laps or so. I think that's what he's thinking of. We'll see if it does play out. Again, the long, gone, long con strategy here at Atlanta can tend to be the one to go with, but early on in this one, who knows? You can see the two of the Edel now. He'll drop back at the outside. That's the 15 of Chris Parkman on the bottom. He has been very quiet this evening, but is MGD Pontiac now. Cycles through as he's got the Pontiac decals on that Chevy Camaro. He'll now get into a race high, number four spot. Don't look now, but Thomas George, even with some damage, the black and the blue number nine car next up on the Yeno, our biggest mover thus far, started 27th to B6, now just eclipsed by Rittenberg, who started 37th and has gone up to 9th. Every week, we'll award a Doppler Durham on the radar, hard charger award, the biggest mover, but you have to qualify to get in that. Thomas George holds that spot, but he's under attack. Shane Parrish for the pass on the inside. Michael Kaczynski at this point are some good candidates at this point and based on what we've seen there's the chance they're in great situations you see them on the screen for example right now George 
right now in that sixth position, plus 21. Eberhardt, plus 20. Redenberg, a plus 28. Some good performances inside the top 10. If some drivers really getting the good works out of this one. You mentioned the Rittenberg and Everhart, and those drivers all into the positives. As I say the Donnie name, he goes to the outside of Blake O'Connell. Funny for eighth and ninth position right now. That's the 67 on the bottom. The Donnie car up on the outside of the racetrack, and Everhart chugging along up top. He's got it, so he'll take that one back from O'Connell. He'll go for a two first, swinging to the inside. What a drive for the 90 car. Looking pretty sturdy right now at this point. And this is one of his best racetracks, remember, Evan. He had some good performances here in the Xfinity car in the Icebreaker Winter Series and with the Cup car back in 2019 before he crashed out of second place. So he's got some good pace at Atlanta, and he's showing that pace right now, one of the fastest cars on the track. And Everhart is somebody who certainly could put a whole season together. He can 110% compete for the Full Throttle Cup if he's able to do so this year. Again, Malik Ray and Adam Benefield, the two race winners so far from this season. No Adam Benefield anymore. His nut is done because he dropped out in a no start for Malik Ray this year. If both of those drivers can make 10 starts on the season of the 20 in regular season, those wins will automatically punch their tickets to the playoffs. So, of course, winning means that much more in the RSR Cup Series. Yeah, indeed, and those drivers know that down at the racetrack level, knowing they need to get W's here. But look at some of the cars trying to make moves. Mogar with damage on his race car, getting some pushes now from McClendon, who's got some damage as well on his 22 machine. Able to make the move on George, who has the fresher nose out of that three. I thought Thomas George, based on where he was running off for the restart, was going to be, you know, putting up some fights here off of the green fly, but instead it has been a one-way ticket the wrong direction. And part of me has to think that it's the back end damage. See the back end damage on the car in front of McClendon right now up in line here? That's the back end of Bogart, who's all beat up. That's kind of how the back of McClendon looks. It's also kind of how the back of George looks. I mean, everybody has got that back end damage just for all the checkups and incidents. If that's all you've got, I think you're feeling pretty okay. And of course, it's not going to mean the car is uh, awful. I mean, they're still in the draft, but certainly those race cars not at 100%. Yeah, I'm still concerned even with that back end and damage just in case how the car feels on the long run. I'm even more concerned, obviously, if the front end is damaged because you have to work that much harder because you're down that straight line speed. It makes it more difficult to pull in competitors in front. Compare that to a clean race car. You can potentially make moves like Everhart has been doing on the short run. Just watching up front, Michael Loria has been able to pull away just a little bit. The car way up to the outside is Andrew Ferdinand. He is getting lapped in his heavily damaged Ford Mustang. So that was not a battle for position. There you can see, though, the interval between one and two. Michael Loria on Grant Davis. That's the fight right now for the race lead. It is just in excess of about 1.1, 1.2 seconds. Uh, as they continue to fight for P1, Raya's last lap, 31, 244, 155 for Davis. So he kind of tries to reel him in just a little bit there, trying to run away from Chris Parkman in his own right, has finally seen some separation. Yeah, and this was what I was expecting a little bit at this point of the race, at least once you got a long run in. The thing is, though, are these drivers going to be able to save the tires in second and third to be able to have better grip than Mariah. That's the question I'm kind of also thinking. Remember, Mariah has only made one total stop. The drivers behind him have at least four or five lap pressure tires that have also gone through a couple heat cycles. So they've kind of got the tire advantage. And I think at this point, Mariah might be pushing a lot knowing that. And of course, if this thing could play out, Justin, we've been back in the green flag conditions after those slew of yellows since lap number 29, so only about a dozen laps into this run. But that left us just inside of 100 laps to go. So in theory, could you one stop it at Atlanta? And if you could, is that even a good idea? Well, the fuel window at this point, yeah, you mentioned a little bit 
Andrew Freenos was able to scratch his 64 laps, for reference sake. So at this point, yeah, you can get a one-stopper. Here's the main concern, though. Do you feel confident enough to get to that hit stop? Because there is a strong chance of blowing the right front tire out by stretching it longer, even by about 40 laps total a run, if you burn it up too much. So it's the question of, are you confident enough to be able to save enough tire while keeping a decent amount of pace to be able to get to a one-stop situation? Wouldn't be surprised there is a decent amount of two-stoppers of drivers trying to avoid that scenario. And all of that put a big asterisk on it because it all depends on if this thing can stay green. You can see a single file line coming out of turn four. They are now going to go to the inside working around the lapped traffic. But this side by side is for position. It is George on the inside. They planted up top. Both of these cars have kind of been fall, falling back through traffic together through all of this and the nine car is going to be out for the time being he says thank you very much to steve durham who was the lot the machine down on the apron there and went down and out of that preferred lawn on the exit of two so that they wouldn't really be adversely affected uh, by his presence again with all of the cars torn up even if you don't got a front end no nose no front clip stick in this thing even if you finish a handful of laps down, you can still be looking at top 25 points with the amount of attrition we've seen to this point. Side by side now, third and fourth. Parkman going to get past the Shane Parrish on the move. Yeah, Parrish all of a sudden looking pretty sporty right now, even with this little bit of damage on the run, left front around where the hood's at. So pretty impressed by what I've been seeing here from that Aegis driver. I think there's a chance he might be able to reel in second. The pace he's going, a 30.696 last time by. That was a little bit quicker than Grant Davis. It's just a little bit better again to Parrish was involved in an incident back on lap number 19. So that kind of slowed his roll a little bit for the driver who started in 11th position earlier on this evening. Uh, to be fair to uh, Daniel Eberhardt and even to Chris Parkman behind, they are not really letting him get away much at all. It is a three-car group, and then you got to jump back a little bit to find McBride, who then leads his own quartet of cars with Nieto, Mogard, of McClendon and company. There you can see the separation, the group of three. There's a group of four with some side-by-side -side behind them as Thomas George can't go anywhere without side-by-side -side with somebody. It wasn't for position. It was with the lapped car, but it, I mean, he has been awfully busy as we see Nieto. What a block to the inside. Jared Mogard went for the move, and it almost ended awfully. Yeah, I'm not sure what Nieto was thinking there at this point of the race. Yes, you're starting into a run where it's important for track position to maintain the bottom. Here's the thing, though. You have to think about when you actually want to make moves like that. That really didn't accomplish anything. He's already getting passed on the outside now by McClendon. That's not a good amount of pace for Nieto, who, mind you, too, is on those slightly older tires. That's how significant staying out and coming down for fresh rubber on a 4-5 lap stint can be. And that's going to add up. You know, on the short run, drivers may not have noticed those differences, but you can only go three laps or so, but you're always going to be that extra half a tenth behind somebody. And listen, it doesn't sound like a ton of time. In reality, it is not. But when you're talking about a race that where top speed times for all of these cars, the fastest on track to the very slowest earlier in practice was just a half a second. Well, that extra half a tenth or half a you know, hundredth every single lap around is going to compound itself, but it is going to be Make things more difficult not just straight speed wise but handling i think you're going to lose more of the speed on handling than you do with the race car just being slower in general and you can see tice here working up on the inside he is really flirting with that apron tice is two laps down right now and we're gonna go three wide here goes mogar to the bottom i don't know about that one two wide fight with the left car in the middle yeah, and I was not going to be happy about that one, but at the same time, I was thinking Mogart was, at the very least, going to use the lap car as a potential pick to get that position. I just wasn't expecting him to try and make it three wide. I would have fallen behind Nieto and then take the bottom line. That way, he might have gone in the position either way. It's Well, on the bright side, he still got the spot. He did. He got the job done in the end, but... Uh... 
by what means necessary as now you go on board with Thomas George who sits behind all of this chaos. The car in front of him is the two Indiano just further up the road is Jared Mogard. If you can ever identify Mogard, just remember he's the one with no number on the roof of that car in his double O machine. That's the easiest way to keep an eye on it. And I mean, everybody's got some damage right now, so they're certainly trying to limp their way through this one as we start to close in on halfway in this boosted Dot Club 192. Indeed, here, and in, it's going to be curious again who ends up taking what strategies. Wouldn't be surprised you, Revan, if you're in fights such as this, as soon as you get within the reasonable fuel window, I'd say under 60 laps to go, how many drivers try and undercut their fellow competitors here to try and get themselves clean air? It'd be a major gamble where you need a caution flag to be in the best track positions, but it's a move I wouldn't be surprised to see happening. Four lap traffic coming up, uh, or I guess the race leaders coming up in a lap traffic as they continue to cycle things through. A heavily damaged entry for Trevor Balderrama. Going to be the latest one for the race leaders to get on by. Shouldn't be a problem. They'll all just tuck down to the inside. No immediate battles for position. Uh, so you don't have to worry about anybody getting pinched out or squeezed out in a three wide spot. So uh, Raya able to navigate up front. His advantage, though, as we mentioned, and you know, we've been watching all of this action kind of mid to high top tens, Justin. That battle for the race lead last time we really talked about it was about 1.1 1.2 seconds it is down to half a second so Grant Davis has been reeling in Lariah trying to close in for the number one spot and that was kind of my concern not just with the strategy to stay out there Evan was there is the tendency sometimes in the clean air where you just keep it full throttle go around the racetrack and then you realize Oh no, I burned up my tires, and then the clean air advantage dissipates, and now the drivers behind have the fresher tires. So that's kind of the balance when it comes to driving with a same setup as somebody else. Sometimes you build setups that can compensate for that if it was an open race. Everhart and Parrish, and then of course a little bit bigger of a jump back to Parkman. It was actually down to pit road, the 15 car may not want to commit to the one stop or he may go in for two stops to the end because Parkman just gave up P5. Interesting decision. He could have maybe stretched an extra couple laps to at least be at the borderline for what some air drivers were able to get on fuel. I think the thought process again though is he's prioritizing tires compared to what fuel is because there has been about two seconds total of fall off for these drivers and they've ran maybe 30, 40 laps on the stint. And that's certainly larger than what we're used to seeing. As you can see, Park Madow has dropped to 18th position. A cycle off of the pit lane. His service is done. It was a four-tire call in and out. Uh, but I'm not seeing a big influx of cars following him down to the pit lane. He went uh, about 30 laps or so on this run. That makes sense for the two-stopper. You would have to go down to the pit lane again, probably right at about lap number 90, 90 to 95 or so for that window. Uh, but for the time being, nobody else up front willing to give it up. And Grant Davis just took another tenth of a second out of the advantage of Michael Lariah. So he is digging. Everhart closes on him at the same time. We could be about a few laps away from possibly a three-way race for the lead. And it's going to get dicey too because you see that lap traffic right up the road there that's taking up two lanes. It's getting to the point where those drivers are bump drafting each other and it's going to be potentially sketchy to get around those guys. It is, and of course, the longer into the run you get, you're going to find this now, where there's actual fights for position. It is an interesting group here. Caldwell and Pascarella are for position. Steve Soa is not. So two of the cars of those three that are about to catch are fighting each other, uh, but one of them is not. And if you just catch one car with you know heavy damage and it's about 20 seconds off the pace, they stay up high, they get out of the way and it's kind of a, a, you know, no loss, no risk, and uh, very easy to deal with. But it looks like that just in time for the race leaders to catch up, Pascarella was able to win out in that fight to, with the 17 machine to Caldwell. It is holding up Mariah, though, on the bottom. He's not going to be able to take the exit how he wants it. And now here comes Davis trying to draft up. Now the disadvantage flips. It'll hurt the 24 car as they all have to be really shallow on entry in turn three. 
and that actually burns up the right front especially a lot more is it ends up adding more heat trying to take it that shallow and in turn it adds more wear the hotter the tire the more the tires wear Okada and Redenberg prior choicing tires they went and pit this past couple laps all of this plays in as Nieto and Mogard almost touched at a turn two. So while we're still waiting on this battle for the race lead to happen at any moment now, I mean, they were just mere inches off of each other's quarter panel. Nieto was on the bottom, and Mogard was able to squeeze by on the outside. There's that checkered flag roof pattern for the double-O car of Mogard. Uh, and so Nieto obviously acute on uh, being aggressive here and try to make this thing happen ASAP. There's the drive to the inside, really close on the quarter panel. He'll try to give Mogard very little room, and they'll now go side by side this fight for seven. And it looks like right now he remembers taking th being taken three wide with the lapped car because of Mogard. At this point, I think Nieto has not given him any slack because of that. He's trying to push him up the track and get him to back off the throttle. Mogart's not giving up. He is not going to give up, but look at the 15 to machine up into the mix as well in this Chris Park. But again, just came down to the pit lane. He's got fresh tires. Look at him make it look easy. Three wide on the outside as he tries to not give up time. And that was sketchy because it hurt Mogard's exit. He couldn't go all the way up to the wall. Thought that that may have played into the hands of Nieto as they'll both go around Steve Durham on the apron, who's coming into the pit lane, I think, maybe this time. But I know just going to drive around one more time on the inside of the racetrack. But, you know, all of this going on, well, Grant Davis's charge up front is stalled out for a brief moment. If I'm him, I may have to be worried about Eberhardt getting on me before I can go for the race lead. The 90s there looks to the inside. There's not room, though. The 24 wouldn't give it to him. And that lost them a tenth because Davis had to check up. He wasn't expecting that to happen. He was just trying to arc it down. And I don't think he meant that there. He just wasn't expecting that type of move, but... You refer to it a little bit there. Eberhardt, he's saved the tires pretty well. Parrish has also done the same for this point of the run to try and make money moves such as right here. Here it is. He'll go to the inside. He was able to set this one up a lot further in time. He'll rock it on the bottom and made that one look easy. How about Daniel Eberhardt now? Past halfway at Atlanta. He'll move into second spot. It did cost both of them a little bit of time, though. Mariah was able to pad about two, three more car lengths on them while they fought side by side. So his advantage now are probably going to be a bit over a half a second as the last time by he was able to gain a few hundreds. I think there's a chance, though, that Eberhardt, the way he's been able to have extra grip compared to Mariah, might be able to close this up in at least a few laps or so. It's just a matter, though, of breaking up the bubble because once you get to about two, three tenths back, that's where it gets very difficult to actually get the draft to pull you forward. It almost pushes the driver in front ahead a little bit faster. So Eberhard, I think, has to remember that. I wouldn't be surprised to try and see to break up a little bit of that air and try and get some cleaner on the nose, at least with the corners, and arc it a little bit differently. We'll see if they do try to move around and search a little bit for a better combination. Uh, still seeing that group now as Grant Davis goes from being the one on the attack to the one being attacked as Colby Buck now giving the latest driver to go down to the pit lane. Look at the 81 of Ishida Parrish. She was just about to set up Davis for a pass and then that lapped car into Parkman again just came blowing by them with his fresh tires. Now's the run. He'll look to the inside in turn three. Grant Davis gonna try to hold the middle and he's gonna be able to put up a more of a fight this time through as he stays in front for now. Yeah, just couldn't get the running one on the bottom. And one thing you might notice compared to what we've seen in past events here on Mile and a Half Circuit 7 is the top line used to be very beneficial to defend where you can ramp it off. Ever since the new iRacing update that happened in the past week and a half or so, it's not the same case at Atlanta Motor Speedway because of the amount of tire degradation. You want to be on the bottom because the amount of speed you even get on the top only gets you maybe a half a car length at the most down by the end of the straightaway. 
And that's not just going to be enough, uh, you know, over the course of time that you're working with here. Now that the second half of the race is underway, the, all these drivers pretty much committed to going for the one stopper to the end. That means that, you know, we're about five laps or so away from, uh, you know, five, ten laps away from seeing the masses come down to the pit lane to split this run in half to the end. The drivers who have looking for a two-stop strategy, maybe those who've already done one stop on this run still have about another 20 laps to go before they hit their window to be able to make their second final stop and go with the distance but the sun's back out so track temps gonna go back up they had kind of trickled down into the low 100 and teens we're at 116 right now track temp sun comes out gonna heat up only gonna make that tire wear that much worse as these drivers by far and large now on the oldest tires they've seen all night long yeah, and this is now the concern where if you've gotten a little bit too fast or too hard you might blow out the tires here, so if you stretch it further than this, you got to keep that in mind. Some drivers are ducking down. More guards are already in the boxes. Nieto just got underneath the yellow cone. So these drivers go on the shorter end. If they pit now, they're looking at it basically right on the money. 50 laps to go to the end of this race. We have been greened for 45 laps now since our last restart. Uh, so roughly midway point. We'll see now who makes the first play of the race leaders because that tire fall off is so extreme of these two leaders first car to pits get to instantly gain about two seconds so if i'm daniel everhart i would normally recommend hey go for the undercut pit now and beat him but i think everhart if both these cars stay out on track i think the 90 car is good enough to pass him so adversely and that could be huge for points as well it could be, and we'll see now how much value these drivers. 35 to second, and it triples down at a point per position because of that buffer up front. But if you're outside the top 20, you're in low teens or single digits. So being up front, top five, to only the top six, seven cars get more than 30 points in a week. I mean, it is heavily weighted to those top 10 finishers. Absolutely, and that's going to be key for a lot of these competitors here with some of these strategy calls, too. So every single one of these drivers here, Evan, are considering things and looking at their fuel gauges and making sure what they can do here for this stint. And the lead is getting tight here. This is going to get pretty dicey here, right at the edge of the window here. As they go in, they're getting to where there are four five-lap cars. Everhart's in. Everhart's in, and he's got more cars down to the pit lane with him. It looks like that Parrish may have followed him down to pit road. He did, but Michael Loria ends up not being the first car to make a move. Everhart is down pit road. He looked pretty clean on the entry. He's going to go for four tires at fuel. He's going to get the fresh rubber right away, and he is going to get back out onto the track soon. So does Lorai respond? Yes, he does. You're on board with him. He'll bring that car down pit road nice and easy to pit road speed of 50 miles an hour. I mean, he is pitted in the Profile Machine product Chevy. Now let's watch as he gets serviced and gets back out on track if he ends up behind Eberhardt through the cycle. I think there's a chance that, yes, he's going to cycle up. There was one factor. You see that 22 pit up right behind him? He went off in the grass, ended up missing the pit entry after sliding along past the yellow cone and off into the grass and then stole out the car and held up Everhart for at least about a second when running on the outside line of the pit lane. Not gonna be too much of a factor, but it does lose him a touch bit of time. You're gonna see the 44 on the apron as Daniel Everhart comes by. There he goes. <laughs> he made sure to get those left side tires down as low as he could. Say sayonara, that's why I think Lariah should have made the pit stop first. Again, Everhart, I think, of these two, on the very long run was the fastest regardless which is why the 44 could have used that bit of an advantage he did not and even with that small hold up daniel everhart comes back out and 
would probably end up as the net race leader. But for the moment, he's actually a lapped car. Grant Davis has assumed the race lead at lap number 83. He, McBride, George, Cheney, and Parkman all lead lapped cars right now, which is keeping those leaders who just pit technically a lap down. Nicholas Caldwell is smoking. He is down to pit road as the 17 car might have blown up. Yeah, he definitely blew up, and he's already been telling drivers about that situation off of the pit lane. So, unfortunate for Caldwell, his engine going kaput. And you can see him just having to go to the apron. He's running along in clean air, but the main thing is, you have any type of engine damage or even hit the red just for a little bit. There's any time you could blow your engine, it happens for him in the middle of one and two. But he was able to get down to the pit lane no matter what. There you can see the transition up and down it onto the flat of the back straightaway. So he did a very good job of, uh, and, and did have some help finding a little bit of a break in traffic uh, to be able to get down and, and out of the way. Uh, so no caution if we stay green and this thing continues, um, you know, to, to play itself out. Uh, still waiting as we see these cars cycle through uh, as Chris Parkman may end up actually being our net race leader as we wait Davis, McBride, George, and Cheney to bid. Again, all of this keeping in mind that the pit stop uh, for Chris Parkman last happened at lap number 59. So he would have to go 65 laps if he wanted to go to the end. Technically not impossible, Justin, but certainly believing uh, that this car is on a two-stop strategy and he'll be back down pit road shortly. You mentioned the 65. I'm wondering if that was the main thought is if he can save enough fuel, he might maybe have a Hail Mary for that. Here's the problem. It's a maybe. And he's also, I think, going to potentially at the very least sacrifice one lap. That's the main thing when you do a massive uh, undercut, though. You gain massive amounts of time. Compare that to the overcut. Yes, you have the fresher tires. You sacrifice the time then, but there's a chance you can rally it all back here at the track like Atlanta. We'll see if that is going to be the play for Parkman, the long game, or if he does just stick with the two stopper. You can see Davis now blending oh, back up. Ocano around the back stretch. Caution, there it is, lap 87 for Blake O'Connell, his spinner in the 67 to Ford. And that changes everything. But it was not on his own. It actually started with Eric Stanford, who was into the wall on his own. And you can see there, it's O'Connell just trying to avoid him. Stanford made a good save. O'Connell swerved to avoid him, got into the wall, came back down and tagged him, and they both spun. Well, this changes everything, and then some with so many drivers pinned a lap down, but... You can see there, right there, O'Connell just was losing the back end, even without Stanford being there, and just trying to switch the high side. Instead, swung it too hard and hit the safer barrier on the outside. And Stanford could have locked it down enough to keep it off the racing surface, so everything just has been flipped upside down. Ten drivers are on the lead lap, Evan. Basically, all of our contenders outside of Everhart and Lariah and Mo Garn and Nieto and Parrish are pinned a lap down. And this is big for the guys who stay out, the likes of McBride and George. I mean, those drivers uh, who, you know, we were still awaiting to come down to the pit lane. And for this to kind of finish its cycle through as the nod is already off and into his box. Once they pitted, they would have been way behind. Instead, they catch a yellow. But the five car missed his pit stall. Rhett McBride went too deep into the box. You can see the jack is just up now. They're going to go over to the left-hand side. He should still be okay. There's a second look. Too deep. Went to the white line. He's going to get out of the pit lane now. Still well ahead of a majority of the cars just because they pitted so far ahead of them. But that mistake stake does cost him the very top spot as Thomas George wins off of pit road. So an interesting scenario here to say the very least right now. Uh, I'm not sure what to really make of this here Evan. I'm not sure what's going through your head at this point because th this hurts drivers like Ty. This helps drivers like Ty a little bit to get back one lap down but Grant Davis he's pinned. David Washington pinned. Gary Sexton some of the other drivers who were contenders. This actually helps even more though, Chris Parkman, because we talked about the potential of the fuel in, it's a strategy that works out best if you get a caution. Parkman got the caution, 
He's now in the top five, and, and back where he was running before he went for the undercut. Hey, this is big for him because assuming again, I mean, if he was trying to stretch it on fuel just that he wasn't going to win the race. If he could have stretched it, that is. If he was going to pit for the two-stopper, also wasn't going to win the race. Instead, catches the yellow before either of those uh, you know, decisions had to be made on if he was going to commit to either way. I mean, he and Bobby Cheney get big gains in this. I know the plus-minus is going to show that Daniel Everhart is the driver who is primed to take home tonight's Durham or Doppler Durham on the radar hard charger award after starting in 29th and running into P5 right now. Uh, so he technically looks like the biggest mover. Uh, but Daniel Everhart, somebody who is going to fight for the race win in this one regardless. Cheney and Parkman, big opportunities here. Yeah, huge chances for some valuable points here. Don't count on Brian. He showed some good speed here as well here at Atlanta Motor Speedway. Man, this has just been an intriguing one to say the very least. And now it becomes important. How good are you at maintaining tires while keeping pace up in the short run when you have so many chances for positions up for grabs? We're going to find out who's going to be the best of that. And Everhart is very good on the short run we've seen with this high downforce package in 2020. And now we see how this shakes out because it is not as simple as... You know, a dash to the end. Comparatively to the green flag run we just shot, sure, I mean, it is not a long way to go to the end. That time by taking 35 laps to go. Lights out on top of the pace car. And the wave buys are going to get on and get out of the way. But we saw a lot happen in the first 30 laps of this race. Remember, it was non-stop cautions back to back to back in the opening 30. Then we went green from that point to now. With 35 to go, it is not a lot of time, sure, but we've seen how much could happen in that time period. Thomas George, McBride, Cheney Parkwin, the four drivers who caught the yellow, take over the top four spots. P5 on the back would have been the fight for the race win. Otherwise, with Everhart fifth, Mogard sixth, and Loria in seventh. Yettle still in the eighth position to... Uh... This is going to be intriguing, to say the very least. 34 laps to go. It's the matter, though, of will cautions breed cautions or will we get a long run? Going to be intriguing either way. We're going to find out as that nine car gets set to take us back to the green flag. This one comes with 91 laps down and 34 laps to go in Hotlanta. The nine car at Thomas George. Green flag in the air. Off and away once more. He gets a decent jump. He'll lead to one. McBride thinks about going to the inside. He does slide across the 99 car. A little bit more patient he was just to arc it a little bit down to the bottom side. And part of that, trying to build up speed for this move right here. There it is, the crossover to the bottom. He's going to be really shallow, though, on entry to turn three. Is it going to hurt him? No, it does not. It's stuck like glue on the bottom. And Rhett McBride, just like that, evaporates. That mistake he made on pit road, he's back atop of the nine. Look at the fight, though, for third on back. These drivers really trying to find any hole they can. Mogart just can't get anything to go, though. That top line just doesn't have enough speed, even on the middle line, to get that going. He just can't get the speed that it needs there. You can see struggling now as Daniel Everhart going to try to split the gap. He'll clear Mogard, move to the outside, and faked now both high and low before he finally commits to the outside of Cheney. This fight now for third on track. If I'm McBride or George, I'm worried, but there's contact. Cheney slides up. They touched. I don't know how they didn't wreck him. Yeah, that was very dicey there, and this is the perfect opportunity again for Mogart. Cheney is one of the drivers who have minimum damage on his race car on the front nose. You can see that affecting him, and Everhart knows this. Finally does the proper thing, in my opinion. Get to the bottom. He does. He gets down to the inside. Now we'll see if he's got a better chance at clearing that 99 at Cheney. Yes, he does. At a turn two, it's his. Eberhardt back to third. Did lose a little bit of time, though, as the top two have pulled away just a tad. Now Parkman will go to the bottom of the 99. He'll also get around Cheney, so that 99 Ford not enjoying being pushed up high. Yeah, 
this is not the best of starts for Cheney here, but again, he does have that damage and also becomes the question if he's got engine damage, even a little bit, it can hurt him on the straightaways, help him in the corners, but make him potentially ran over his contact. Now they get into each other. We're going to fan out three wide with the 81 of Parrish on the apron. Somehow we get away with it again as Mogard got loose, came down on Parrish. That could have been a big mess of sheet metal instead. We are still green as we get away with another one. Here's the onboard shot, a second look. It almost looked more like Mogart scraped the wall. Keep an eye on the right side of your screen. Right there, just pinged off the edge of the wall and right into Parrish. But heck of a move for Parrish to be able to keep his grip up even on the apron and be able to get back on the racetrack without major incident. You can see when he got back up and onto the racetrack how high he went. So he had to hold that apron until he was clear of the one car, then made the move back up and onto the surface so that he would not take Joseph Tice down, who has trapped the lap down in this pit cycle. The one in the four cars right there, funny. Oh, and what a block to the inside by Joseph Tice. He had to get around a slow Steve Durham, nearly took the front end off of Emery. That is a fight for 14th and 15th. They are not fighting the cars around them. That is the fight for the lucky dog spot. First car lap down. I'm just wondering what Durham was thinking there. He should have just stayed high. I think he thought there's a hole in the ground of drivers and tried to dive it as hard as he could towards the apron. Problem is, the massive amount of speed difference doesn't allow him to do that easily. You see right there, trying to get to the bottom. They weren't expecting that anyone was behind him. Yeah, just not expecting that to happen. And what a pucker moment for all of those drivers. That's at least, what, the third or fourth we've seen since we've gone back green flag racing. These drivers are not settling down anytime soon. The sun's tucked away again just for a moment. Track temps come back down. Maybe they get a little bit braver now. It peeks back out from behind the clouds as the race leaders go down the back straightaway. A fight, though, is on for second position. A little bit further up from this group. You can see it is Daniel Everhart on the bottom of the nine and he's got it ever heart down into second completing the pass on George and now you have to think can Everhart finally find his way up to the point you can see he was able to get to the bottom side of George and George has not been the best of cars after about 15 or so laps it seems today being passed by drivers with significant front nose damage and now he's already up for grabs for Parkman, who's been having a stellar race, even with the strategy calls throughout this field. We've seen a handful of drivers presented with an opportunity. Can you come in and steal this race? And, you know, even for, if it's not going to be a win, for McBride, George, Parkman, Cheney, I mean, all these drivers who benefited from the timing of the last yellow, which may not be the final one on the night if these drivers keep going the way they have, as we now transition inside of 25 laps to go. Even if it's not going to be a win, a ton of valuable points on the line. But Daniel Everhart is a man on a mission. And honestly, Michael Lariah has been dead in the water since we restarted. It was him and Everhart who were fighting with each other. Lariah's P7 can't do anything with it. Everhart's been the one making the moves through the field. You're on board with him. That last car in front of him is race leader Rhett McBride. Both these drivers looking for the first win of 2020. That's partly why track position was key, and I, we talked about it at the start of the race. It's coming in now. Lorai doesn't have that track position because he started in the back part of the top 10, and the more cars you have to deal with, the more you burn up the tires, the more you burn up the tires, the harder it is to catch up to the rest of the front drivers. So these four drivers have the best chance right now as long as it stays green to take home the W at this rate, especially since Everhart is the better of the two for the top two to arc a caution. There's a caution just as he got to him. It's going to come at 104, and it is Scott McClendon on the back straightaway. Yellow at lap 102, and it was the 22 and the 19. Contact on the back end of the racetrack. Yeah, and keep an eye on Stanford on the top side. He's partly the cause here, really, because... He had a little bit of a bobble that got him loose just on the exit. 
right into the fender of McClendon, and around goes McClendon, right into the middle of the racetrack, uh, my goodness. McClendon lucky to not have additional damage. He was not expecting that. He was just trying to make a pass at that moment. It was for position two laps down. Yeah, it was just the slightest bit, and, and the onboard shot with McClendon is going to be really the best angle here because you can barely see that 19 on the right-hand side, and right there. I mean, McClendon is squeezing him an awfully bit, to be fair, Justin. It is that little bit of a movement down by the 19, but, I mean, you could have given him more room, but I guess late in the race, you, you really don't want to uh, give each other a break, and you want to squeeze, and that's what happens. So we slow things down, and we bring everybody back down to the pit lane. McBride, this time, is clean into his box. This really changes the complexion again. It now makes it very important that you are strong on the short run. That puts drivers like George back in the conversation potentially for the checkered flag. But they need the track position. Race off the pit lane. Side by side, but it is McBride in front. He holds off the 90 for the moment. It is McBride, Eberhardt, George, Parkman, Cheney. One, two, three, four, and five off of pit road. Nobody daring to swing for the fences. They all decide four tires to fuel the decision to be made. And out in front of them, all of the cars that have stayed out, lapped cars, I believe, just trying to get laps back. A handful of drivers, multiple laps down, a couple of them trying to just get back to the lead lap. I mean, with some of the craziness potentially coming up here, I, wouldn't, I don't blame them. Get a lap back if you can, so you can potentially contend if you get a quick caution flag. You don't get one, no harm, no foul. You can race with the cars around you, so that's got to be the call for at least some of these competitors. A few electing not to do that because of significant damage or two laps down. The one's one lap down thinking of that. So it's going to be very in interesting how this end of the race goes here, Evan, to say the very least here. Everhart's been basically the bridesmaid for much of this race. Every time he's about to take the lead, it's here been a difference of strategy. How about it come down the pit lane? And then the caution comes out of this situation. Caution flag coming out right before he makes the pass for the lead. Now it's the matter of can he just get the pass done and get the clean air that he needs to secure this. And perseverance is going to be a big thing in this context and the other thing to keep in mind is that well you want to talk about drivers who've had to persevere andrew freedage had to deal with this how many times last year a dominant race car a bad yellow here a bad yellow there sometimes those caution flags did mess up his race strategy enough to keep him out of victory lane but for the most part they did not so it doesn't matter the cards that you are dealt at the end of the day you still have the ability to get the job done when it matters. And Everhart's going to be on the outside of the front row. The control car does technically have the ability to choose inside or outside for the restart, but uh, seemingly the bottom is where they've wanted to be all night, so we don't expect McBride to change that now. Uh, Everhart's biggest, uh, I think, challenge here would be to not allow George to get up on the inside and to find him for second. Even if he still feels like he's better than the nine, you don't, you don't want to have to sacrifice that time fighting to defend where you are. You only want to go on the attack. And that's going to be the biggest thing. If we can tuck a line behind McBride and he can get the entirety of what I think will be 17 laps to go this time by, uh, then he's got a real good look at this thing still. Absolutely agree with you, but remember, McBride is the one that's the control car here, and he's looked pretty good in the first few laps of the stints all race. So wouldn't be surprised to see that Steel Horse Racing Machine pull away a little bit to start, as we've seen a couple times in this fight for the lead. He also has a team in and George behind him. That's going to be definitely be beneficial to try and at least fight Everhart for a couple laps. Could this be the final restart of the night? This race has had everything. We had a big, a uh, little bit of crash a -rama, early crash and smash him, a lot of yellows, a long green flag run through cycles of green flag pit stops. And now we get set for another late race restart, this time with 108 laps down and 17 laps to go. And the boosted dot club 192, pace car inside, green flag back in the air. Great launch for McBride, but it looks like George didn't get the memo, didn't even get a good launch even with this teammate as the control car. This is going to help Everhart a lot here to get to the bottom early. 
A lot of cars check it up in the center of one and two as everybody tries to snake their way through, but Everhard was able to maintain second. Challenge coming for third as it is Parkman trying to get back to the outside of George. Can't do so. Here's the battle for the race lead. Everhard had a look, but he died out in four. He'll now fight looking into turn one. Surprised he's trying this up top. It looks like he's trying to arc it down the the banking and try and make this move for the bottom. He's going to want to make the move, but he doesn't have the speed that time through quarter two. Here's the speed now in turn three. Earlier in this race, trying to make some of the moves on the outside. Wasn't able to make it stick this time. Still with the nose on the quarter, but he can't get all the way by. And if these two stay deadlocked for the race lead, don't look now. But you've got George, Nieto, Parkman all jumping at the bit there. Third on back as McBride on the bottom tries to pull clear again. He does so for a brief moment. I'm surprised that Everhart's trying to get this to work so hard on the top line. It hasn't been useful all day. And a little bit of contact maybe there off the track. Oh yeah, he is way up and into the marbles as he got into the side of the five. Daniel Everhart going to go from second to fifth just like that. George now in second, Nieto takes third, Parkman in fourth, and Daniel Eberhardt now with a massive obstacle inside of 15 to go. Yeah, I don't know if he's got the track position to contend here in. You'll see it on the entry to term number three. Tries to arc it down a little bit, sidetracked in the middle of the corner, try and get the run off, and then ends up just having a little touch, it almost looked like that bumped him up to the very top line and loses him all the valuable track position. It's gonna take him the rest of this race potentially just to get up to second here, Evan. Yeah, this is going to be a real tough call for him. And look at all of the traffic. That's the biggest thing. Not only is he followed a half a second behind McBride, uh, but he has to deal with the cars. That's what's going to be holding him up. Sam Nieto really pinching him down in turn three. The Nani is going to be right on his door, trying to get that car back into third position. His nose is in front that time by. Does he clear in turn one? Yes, he does. So Everhart now back to third. Next on deck, George, who's chasing down McBride for the race lead. It's going to be interesting, though, because Everhart, you can see how much more momentum he's able to carry, even on the middle line. This is absolutely impressive from the 90 machine. It seems like he's content on trying to make these moves work from the top. Now gets to the bottom, finally. He is on the bottom. Again, trying to make the initial move for the race lead up top. Did it work this time at the bottom? He is three for three. Passing on the inside, but it's not over yet now. George crosses him up. He'll go counter-punching to the inside. Nieto wants to run the high side. Can Daniel Everhart carry the speed on the outside of three to four? He can't get away. The nine car just barely hanging on. Now he's all the way by. He's back into second position. Nine laps to go at Atlanta, and he's looking to make up three and a half car lengths. It's going to get close. He's been one of the fastest cars on this racetrack in the stint. Loria, though, is coming up and quick as well here, Evan. He's also going to be in the conversation. I mentioned on the run prior to this that Loria was kind of dead in the water, thought that maybe he would be better because at this point in that long green flag run, it was him who was going to the race lead and pulling away. He only struggled really late on, but he's still back in traffic and Everhart's there now for the lead. He tried to look to the outside again. He's going to have a ton of speed and a turn two. One car length back, a half a car length. Now even with the bumper, but again, McBride protects the inside, forcing the 90 to look high. Yeah, he's trying to break the, break the slipstream as well as try and block the bottom, protect the lane. And Everhart's going to be all but forced now to try and get that top line to work if he wants any shot. This is going to potentially allow drivers like George and Loria though into the conversation again. 
They are right back on it, and if they get side by side for the lead, even minus the contact that we saw the last time, once they got there, it allowed those third, fourth, and fifth placed cars to close back in. Everhart, though, seems persistent to not want to force the issue down low, but he lost a lot of speed that time at a four. He had to dive it back down in just to not lose anything. He made his passes to get back to this spot on the inside, but he keeps trying to go for the race lead up top. Does he look low? this time. He's in line with McBride. Still sticks the nose out high and I think McBride's content with that as he'd rather protect the bottom side by side for a moment. Now he'll tuck back down to cross over. Not enough room. McBride tries to shut the door. He'll push his way through though. Side by side for the lead. Got the chance to get this pass done. He's got the preferred line and we're trying to push behind. It was a real nice move to fake high to go low. He almost took the five out in the process, but was able to push his way through. And now we're nose to nose for the lead. This time by, going to be five laps to go from Atlanta Motor Speedway. In third spot now, Michael Lariah still not giving up as McBride looks very good on the outside. He stays in front by a half a car. McBride's doing a very impressive job defending. The thing is, though, he can't stay up there for long. It's just around that point where the top line starts to die off a little bit, and you still want to be on the bottom, and it gets tougher to pass. He's done an impressive job, though, to keep the momentum up on the middle. This is something that the Donnie car was not able to do when he was on the outside. He could get to the quarter panel, and that was it. McBride is kind of keeping the Nandi at his, but now Lariah opts to go to the bottom. He almost pushed Everhart down the front straightaway that time to get him back even once more. There are right now six cars within half a second of the race lead. Everhart still not giving an inch. Rhett McBride refusing to go away on the outside with the Nandi car on the bottom. I still think he's in the best position here. This this time by, we'll see three laps to go. You've seen that a little bit on the entry to three. Backed off the gas, Eberhardt did a little bit. Rick McBride in contact oh, he got turned. Thomas George is it? Yes, the nine car, but there is no caution. We stay green for the moment. And Nieto and Parkman now out of the conversation. Just a three horse race for the race, race win. All those cars recovered it, so I don't think it's going to count as an incident. No manual yellow. We stay green. Everhard works the bottom. McBride now losing some track position up top. He's almost all the way behind, but he's got Lariah in line with him now. A four-way battle. Now just a three-way fight for the win. Popsicle six in the air. Second last time at a two. The five car drove it in too deep. And Everhart now clear for the race lead. Just couldn't make it stick much longer as I was expecting there. But now Raya might have a chance for one last gasp on the final lap. He takes over second position and a caution flag. Just moments before the white flag would fly, we've got a spinner and it is Chris Parkman in the 15 car. We are not done yet. I think he got turned, Evan, and I think that might have to have a, some looks on that because he got a bit of a run. These are two of the drivers who are just involved in the incident in turn one and try to go all the way to the bottom side and ends up hooking Parkman in the process. There is definitely contact between those two and maybe this would be a good opportunity if we can as we'll see the contact here. If we could also get a second look at that near incident that happened just prior to get some context to this because you can see the two chase that are down, goes to the bumper and that looks like uh, some head hunting. He does claim responsibility for the caution uh, but certainly got into him and turned him around. Uh, and we'll see uh, if that one does get anything additional in a post-race review. This is what happened leading up to it. You're on board with the nine of Thomas George. This was the fight that we saw the spin happen behind those race leaders as they went off and into turn number one. You can see it's George who gets hooked there with those second two cars in line with Nieto and the 15 machine. I mean, those were the two that we just saw get into it on the back straightaway. So I think you're right, Justin. I think that was a message delivered for the previous contact yeah at the very least it was a message delivered whether it was for 
the block or whether it was for that incident remains to be something that's amongst those drivers but not what you want to see but here's something other competitors didn't want to see a few cars stayed out evan lariah harris pascarella parkman all remained on the track everhard and mcbride are the first drivers on new tires it was not a consensus decision by the race leaders to head down to the pit lane because with that caution flag coming out literally, what, 10 seconds away from taking the white flag and this race being official, this means we have to go into real sim racing overtime. We are not done yet. And restart procedure brings us to our first of a possible three attempts at a green white checkered finish. So I'll be honest, I don't hate the call to stay out for the track position because it's only going to be two laps. The problem is, it is such a small buffer. If you had, with now we see, we see Pascarella at a parkway to come down to the bit lane, if we had 10 cars stay out, probably would have been plausible. With only, I think, Lariah and Parrish, I think they're going to get swallowed up by Thur on the back. Yeah, this is not good in... And we're not talking about just on tire spin again. These drivers are going to need a hope for cautions, precautions to even keep the track position, I think, by the time they get to turn three. Because they're going to be so tight that they won't be able to carry full throttle. Everybody else can go full throttle. So in other words, the first driver to get through cleanly likely might take the checkered here, Evan. And we'll see if it plays out how we think it will. Or if this thing has a few more twists, because the problem for Everhart and McBride here, at least, is that they still have to get around those cars on the front row here. So the way that it, it looks now is you got Lariah Parrish, real old tires, on the front row. Probably going to be spitting them, going to be real tough to get these things going. Then you're going to have a really antsy Daniel Everhart and Rhett McBride, who again, with the first cars off of the pit lane, decided to go for four tires. But they need to find a way by. So as the lights go out on top of the pace car, you have to be prepared for a lot of chaos. We'll see if these drivers are able to navigate it or if there's a little bit more calamity as we go uh, right now with the restart. Actually, I believe with the lights out on top of the pace car, uh, you know, we look for this thing uh, to finish itself out. And don't forget about Tice. He went two laps down at one point, Evan, in this race. Remember, he was After the starting on pole. Yeah. yeah. He was one of the cons of one of the caution flags, got the end of longest line penalty, had to come back down a second time down the pit lane, and now he's back in the fifth position. So there's a chance we see Tice try to do something to take the win because he looked very fast in the early portions of this race before he started fourth gear. So don't do that. Make sure you make sure it's in the right gear this time through as we get sent for our first crack of real sim racing overtime. Tonight from Hampton, Georgia, it is Old Tires front row for Michael Larias, number 44, and Shane Parrish's 81 Ford. Everybody else saw the four tires behind. Let's see how it plays out. Green flag back in the air. Two laps to go at Atlanta. And a little tiny bit of a bobble, I think, from the front drivers having some tire spin. Parrish got the worst of it, though. He's already getting swallowed up, and Everhart's in the prime position to make a pass. It was great for Everhart, though, because it was an open door to follow the 44 on the inside. Here he comes in the back straightaway now. He'll look to the bottom, side by side for the race lead. Absolutely no challenge. Daniel Everhart is gone at a four. He looks for the white flag. It looks like he's got it. Yes, indeed. Race officials, two cars in the grass. We got some spinners behind. White flag, though, will stay green as this one's official. Going to be fighting for the rest of the spots up front as Tice takes second. Lorraine now continues to drop as McBride and Mogar to put the moves to him. But for Daniel Eberhardt, late race chaos can't keep him down. The fastest car of the night at a turn four and a ticket to the finale. Eberhardt wins tonight in Atlanta. What a heck of a drive from Daniel Everhart. He was going to potentially eventually take the lead. It was just a matter when. Coming right at the perfect timing there. 
What a way to take on this checkered flank. And what a recovery try for the man in second and Tice. He Tice did such a good job. He was third in line on the inside for the restart. It was just a an awful restart. For that 81 car, a Paris that he outside it killed McBride, who was able to recover for a third. But this win guarantees Daniel Everhart a spot in the postseason. First win of 2020, Daniel Everhart race winner of tonight's Boosted Dot Club 192. And a rightful celebration up top. We questioned it a few times late, Justin. If this thing had gone green to the end, he probably would have won it. Instead, he stayed through the yellows, fought it out, and was able to get it done. Yeah, absolutely. What a race at this point for Eberhardt. And we were expecting this type of performance potentially from him. He definitely delivered in tonight's race, Evan. Let's take a look at tonight's race spot TV results from the virtual Atlanta Motor Speedway. Daniel Everhart checkered flag by a half second over Joseph Tice, who's able to slide into the number two spot at Rick McBride. He finishes in third. We'll do our best to catch up with all of them in just a moment. Continuing on down through the running order, it is Jared Bogart and Bobby Cheney with top five finishes. Michael O'Reilly ends up P6. John Kayla seventh. Shane Parrish in eighth with Thomas George P9. And David Washington a quarter. Wyatt, 10th place. Michael Kaczynski able to recover to an 11th place finish after being involved in a couple different incidents. But Michael Connell finished in 12th. Chris Parkman, after being involved in some of the incidents late, bumped himself down to 13th position. Bradley Burke finished in 14th. Terry Sexton in 15th. Sam Nieto, after triggering the GWC, finishes in 16th. Gene Pascal with the last driver on the lead lap in 17th, with Rinnenberg involved in a crash coming to the white flag in the grass. He came home one lap down with a lone engine in 18th. Anthony Emery and Eric Stanford round out the top 20. Consider it on down to the cars who were damaged, but for the most part, uh... You know, fought out for most of this race. It includes drivers who were kind of still in it, the likes of John Rodden, Steve Soa, and the drivers who were way gone. Colby Vox, Steve Durham, Trevor de Balderrama through P25. Those were the damaged cars who kind of trucked along to get whatever they could, along with Scott McClendon, Brent Davis, Nick Caldwell, Andrew Fridaj, a P29 for the last year's race winner here at Atlanta, and Michael Mosier in 30th. 31st position, John McAdell with a rough one, 107 laps down. Kyle Trudell in 32nd, Andrew Pellegrini in 33rd, Adam Benefield 34th, Liam Sheen in 35th, Daniel Scott, Tom Morano, RJ Williams rounding out the grid. It's a look top to bottom at your race bot TV full race results. We'll step aside for a brief moment and when we come back, we'll go track side, talk with your top finishers to get you set for the next time out as we go racing in Homestead next Monday night. You've been watching race bot TV's coverage of the 2020 Real Serenity Seed Full Throttle Cup Series powered by Boosted. The post race show is next. A shame. You keep doing stuff like that and we're going to lose our sponsor. Looks like that's it for us today.
Now we're back live from the virtual Atlanta Motor Speedway as race bought TV's coverage of the 2020 Real Sim Racing Full Throttle Cup Series continued with tonight's boosted dot club 192. Every race this season is powered by Boosted, the place where gamers and creators go to monetize digitally. They'll build a free e-commerce store and help get sponsorships for those looking to build their brands. Go to Boosted.club for more information. Evan Pasoko alongside Justin Prince and our producer Connery Maddock. Let's go trackside and talk with tonight's race winner from Atlanta, first of 2019 and the 14th of his RSR Cup Series career for Daniel Eberhardt behind the wheel of the Rodani for Daniel. Congratulations on a wild race that when we broke out green, it looked like you were the car to beat, but man, those yellows and late race restarts sure put a little bit of a roadblock in your way. Yeah, uh, that was crazy. Uh, it was a lot of work. Uh, Brett made me work really hard. You could tell that he wasn't going to go down the track, and you know he was going to hold me up a little bit longer than I wanted to step, and we got together going into, um, I think that was one and two, or three and four, I'm not really sure, but we got together, I washed up, fell all the way back to about fifth or sixth there, and then Sam Nito and Chris Parkman were going at it real hard, and uh, you just had to be patient, and if these cars, man, it, it, back in the day when we were running it, the cars, you would zoom through them laps, and it felt like them laps were eternity tonight, I don't know, even me trying to run back up through the field, it felt like it was taking forever for the laps to click off, and then I took the, you know, I cleared Rhett with one to go, and uh, the caution, our yeah, coming to the white, and the caution came out. And I'm not sure what happened in the back. I know Eric and a couple guys back there got tangled up, but uh made it real worrisome because I knew they were going to do the opposite of me, but only two guys did it. Was That was really surprising. And certainly the restart was big for you. I guess the number of cars as well. You know, if it was, as we were saying on the broadcast, 10 cars at the old tires, it might have been a little bit more work, but you know, the outside didn't get a good restart. You tucked right in line to behind uh, really quickly, and at that point, by the time you caught up down in turn three, uh, it was a relatively easy pass, I'll say. Uh, you know, we had seen drivers try to stay out at, at points, and even if it was just a very short two, three lap run, I mean, it was the, the fresh tires that were more important. Was that a, you know, something exclusive here to Atlanta with the tire degradation that made that call for you to go for the tires late real easy? Uh, I felt like uh, we did enough laps there on that little, well, I guess it was like 15, 20 lap run. So when I, I I made the decision coming down the back straightaway, I told Andrew I said I'm coming in. I can't I can't stay out and then get beat by somebody just flying past me. And the 44 when I went by him, he wasn't even gonna throw a block because you know at that moment you're like ah, I'm killed. You know it's just tires are so important at any track, but really at these mile and a half, definitely with this new car, this new package that NASCAR has put out, and this new tire bottle by the sim, it it, it makes it really 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 tough to hold somebody off on older tires now that they've created all this kind of kind of chaos for a little while. The, the package creates a lot of three, four wide. It looks good, but it's very chaotic to drive in, and and you have to wait for the tires to come and fall off. And I think the package after this new build really helped it a lot with the fall off. It felt like it, we got strung out a little bit more than we used to. You're able to go into victory lane uh, tonight, of course, as I mentioned, the first race win of the season uh, for you, which uh, obviously uh, helps things out as you look to fight for the full throttle cup, as is the objective every year. Um, but, of course, still have to, to meet the minimum amount of starts and whatnot. But, of course, uh, wins count for bonus points and whatnot. We've seen now three different race winners in the opening three weeks. What's your assessment on how the season started and uh, the outlook headed into Homestead next week? Well, uh... I mean, the three guys who've won, I'm excluding myself, but Adam and uh, Malik, they're, one's a pro driver and one's a road to pro driver. So uh, it really means a lot to be on that same board with them. But you got guys like Andrew and Dave Washington it's, and even Joseph Dice. I mean, he's been quick all season so far and uh, at these mile and a half and these two mile tracks. So it's going to be tough to know what's going to, you know, goes on later on into the season. It's a long season. And, you know, that message I'll posted today, you don't know if you're going to change up the schedule with NASCAR and we'll see if that falls through just with the, what's ever going on with this, you know, sickness virus that's going around. So, uh, I mean, it's pretty exciting, but we still got a long road 
and uh, we're going to see what we got for the rest of the season. Three down, and that means at least 27 more to go before we do hand out the hardware and the cash and the prizes at the end, Daniel. Though, for here tonight at the Atlanta Motor Speedway, who do you want to give a call to from Victory Lane? Well, I want to thank my teammates, uh, Dave Washington, Dylan Jones, uh, Ross Cato, Stephen Durham, Eric Stanford, Andrew Freenage, Kyle Kamer, uh, all, all the guys, uh, Sean Kalis at SK Racing, just everybody and uh, Fast 40 Sports, uh, Galen Gidman. There's just a lot, so many people to thank. I got to thank my girlfriend who watches at home, or fiance, I'm sorry, uh, and my grandma who's watching in the other room, and the good Lord above, but also got to thank you guys because uh, y'all stuck through this and, you know, we could all be, you know, just to make a little light out of this uh, in quarantine right now and none of us could be playing anything and doing anything, but you guys decided to put this show on and keep us rolling, give us some race cars to look at for a little while. And so I got to thank you guys and Race Spot TV for broadcasting this race and uh, just stay safe out there for all of you guys and even the people watching. Well, we're always happy to have you with us, uh, you know, on a Monday night, uh, regardless of uh, the external circumstances, but especially happy to be, uh, you know, a part of the fun uh, as we can get out here on a Monday night uh, and enjoy some race seat action. Daniel, always appreciate you being a part of the series, though, buddy. Congratulations on the win, and we'll see you next week. Thanks, man. Maybe we can bring home the hardware this year. Looking for it in next time out Homestead of Miami. You're going to be up for round number two and talking about P2, Joseph Tice, Justin once again, found himself second position for two weeks in a row, but I believe you're one further spot down the grid with Rhett McBride, who comes home in third. Yes, indeed. Rhett McBride now joins us in the broadcast booth after a third place finish. Rhett, first things first, how does it feel to come away in third because you had to fight for that one? Uh, doesn't feel great, um, but, you know, the race was good there at the end. I was doing everything I could to keep Daniel from getting to the inside of me. I knew if he could get up under me, he'd check out. He was just fast all night and did every trick in the book to keep him, you know, to, to try to keep that from happening. I was, he was really fast getting into three. And um, that one time there, I was trying to hold him out wide because he just got such a good run down to the bottom of the, of the uh, apron on the entry there. And I was, trying to keep him out wide as I could and I think we got together there a little bit but it wasn't anything intentional I mean we we ran pretty uh pretty hard there for about 10 laps however long it was you know and other than that one time um it's pretty impressive for him to come back up there through there so got to give him credit where credit's due yeah absolutely I was going to ask about that hard fighting on the top side because that was the best we've seen anybody ride up on that top line that entire race when you were side by side after Everhart got to your inside. How difficult was it though to try and make sure you didn't overcook the tires as this race progressed today and as every as there were multiple different temperature swings throughout this race with the most cloudy skies? Yeah, that's kind of been the thing since uh, this new tire came out. I mean, I was out to lunch when I just loaded into the server tonight um i've been working pretty hard and hadn't really had a chance to get up on this new build and figure these things out so um i burnt my tires up in california on the first run and i've been chasing you know how hard i need to push it or how easy i need to drive it ever since you know i went back like i was tied to a stump uh in california and i didn't want that to happen again tonight um, as far as outside, you know, um, uh, I was just hanging on Daniel's door there when we were running, when he had the bottom. Um, and I just got to give him, you know, got to give him credit because it's tough to do when you got a guy hanging on your door like that lap after lap and he never pushed up where it could, he could have done that. And it would have, it would have been, you know, nothing I could have said about it cause, uh, we were racing hard, but he held his line, and he earned that one, and uh, got a lot of respect for that. couple races down on the calendar. What's your outlook on the season so far heading into Homestead? I think it's, you know, we got a, we got some new faces in the series this year. I mean, obviously Malik and um, my teammate Adams back in here, he had some rough luck tonight. Um, 
but you got a lot of fast guys, you know, so, and they're a lot of, you know, they're, they're aggressive, so, um, it's going to be hard to say, but there's probably eight guys off the top of my head that are, you know, you're going to have to beat, and of course, you know, Andrews had some tough luck, um, I'm 100% sure he'll be, he'll be up there fighting too, so it should be a great year, I mean, we've got a lot of talent in this league, and, um, I'm looking forward to the rest of the season. Is there anyone you want to thank before we let you go? Yeah, just want to thank all my uh, teammates at Steel Horse Racing. Um, thank our owner, Swanee, uh, Kevin Pearson, who paints all our cars, does all our graphics. Um, want to thank iRacingIFlag.com, who's been on the car uh, for the first two races. Um, looking forward to next week. Uh, Next week's race, I think we're going to bring a new sponsor on board, so I'm looking forward to that. Um, so, yeah, I just want to thank those guys at Steel Horse and thank everybody who um, watches what we do and hope they had a little fun tonight. I know it's not the real thing, but uh, since the real cars aren't running around, this is probably the next best thing. So, hoping everybody enjoyed it. Looking forward to see who the new sponsor is for your car, but congratulations on a top three finish tonight. Thanks, Evan. Appreciate it, buddy. This is Justin. Thank oh, you. Oh, I'm so delight. sorry, Justin. I just, I just look, man. You guys sound a lot alike. <laughs> we mixed it up on you. We're testing you. Well, it's <laughs> easy to trick an old man like me, Evan. Man, y'all stop doing that kind of stuff. Either way, that is Rhett McBride finishing in third. Evan, back to you. Yeah, we'll see now if we can uh, catch up with our second-to-place finisher, Joseph Pace. I think we've uh, got him trackside as well, who comes away in second position in this one. And Joseph, what a night. You guys start on a pole position, uh, but it was a whirlwind from that point on. Just kind of talk us through the evening. Man, I tell you, I pretty much probably got to carry the dunce cap for, for a while. I had a good run right there at the beginning, first 15 or 20 laps, and then... Coming to that one restart, I was rolling around in fourth gear under caution and just totally wasn't paying attention and went to hit the gas and didn't hear the didn't hear the engine rev up and I was like, whoa and I looked behind me and I was like, I see what I did. So I gotta apologize to pretty much the entire field because that was totally my bad. And then from that I uh had to pit, got a penalty, got two laps down, got a lucky caution, then got the lucky dog and then literally got that last caution that put some tires on it and run back to the front of course uh you know i mean through the field and uh recovery from that blunder it looked like certainly you guys had speed in that car and as we kind of feel these things out and just kick off the season now uh, after missing the season opener in daytona a second place finish in fontana and have a second place finish in atlanta i know that I mean, you would have rather have won. I mean, you'd, you'd like to be sitting here with two checkered flags in a year already, but to be able to have that consistent speed over the course of your first two starts, it has to feel good. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, everybody wants a win. I Like you said, I mean, I'd love both of them to be wins, but I mean, just to, just to get two podium finishes in a row, I mean, I'm really... I really honestly wasn't expecting this. Uh, I don't really run the A car a whole lot, and so I didn't know what to expect. But I have always been good saving my tires, and maybe that's helping me out some. But, yeah, I'm thrilled with the way I'm running right now. Homestead is up next, and it was a point that we made on the broadcast to start is that we've got three weeks in a row of intermediates, 125 laps that added Atlanta, same distance next week at Homestead, same distance the week following at Texas. With this cookie cutter, if you will, kind of string of tracks here in a row to uh, kick off the year with rounds three, four, and five, how do you translate the speed here into those next two? Well, you know, I could just, you know, keep doing what I'm doing, make sure that I'm prepared each week and make sure I know what, what the strategy should be each week. And I've been working with my team and, you know, we've been showing pretty strong. And so, uh, you know, just keep doing what I'm doing because, yeah, if I can just keep the consistency, that's what I'd like to do. And we'll see how it continues to shake out as it is still young in this 2020 RSR Full Throttle Cup Series campaign. But for a back-to-back -back P2 finish coming tonight in Hampton, George, Joseph, anybody want to say hi to? 
Yeah, for sure. You know, I thank my team, you know, Grant and Sam, Bradley and Michael, you know, we've been together for quite a while through several different leagues. And this is the first time we've all been running in a in a top tier big gun league like this with a full full field. And, you know, it, we've surprised ourselves a little bit because we really didn't expect to come out come out as we have. But, you know, thank them. We've been working together really well. Um, you know, thank the RSR admins for the league. It's it's an awesome league. Thank you guys for broadcasting. And, you know, as always, I got to thank my wife for uh, taking the time to watch the kiddos and let me have a couple hours here on Monday night to come have a little fun. And I, I think Daniel mentioned it, you know, with everybody kind of quarantined and everything else going around, I think it's good that, you know, we can still put on a good virtual show. And certainly, uh, late in this one, you guys put on a show, uh, and we certainly enjoyed it from up here uh, with our view in the booth. Other than that, Joseph, we'll let you get out of here. Uh, you know, we'll uh, we'll see you next time out uh, next Monday night to, from Homestead. Certainly. See you then. B2 Finisher in the Boosted Dot Club 192. And as always, we give the hugest of thanks to our drivers, Daniel Everhart, Joseph Tyson, Herb McBride, top three for chatting with us post race and giving us that extra time. What a night at Atlanta at Homestead, which again is typically that season finale, changed on the NASCAR Cup calendar this year, means that we go racing there, Justin. For round number four, that one coming up next Monday night. Good preview of that, by the way, would be the Coke Series race tomorrow night on the IRA City Sports Network. Uh, but the next time for us, it's going to be March the 23rd. Good wink, wink, nudge, nudge on that one. But uh, it's going to be an interesting one, too, because tire wear is still going to be a factor, I think, absolutely at Homestead. But it's also a track that is just about everyone's favorite on the IRA Racing service because... There's multiple different lines you can get working at that track. There's so many battles you can have, and it's such a driver circuit where the skill ends up floating its way up to the top by the end of a chakra flag. Should be a fun one at Homestead, to say the very least. We hope to catch you out with us then. Until next time, though, that's it for us here at Atlanta. Round number three is in our rear view mirror. On behalf of the entire team at Real Civil Racing from RaceBot TV and the broadcast crew tonight. For downstairs, our producer, Connery Maddock. For Justin DePrince and myself, Evan Pasoko. want to thank you for tuning in and to congratulate Daniel Everhart, winner of the Boosted Dot Club 192. We'll see you out next Monday. That is March the 23rd from Homestead Miami Speedway. That race and every race of the 2020 Real Silver Nacy to Full Throttle Cup Series powered by Boosted can be found only right here on Race Spot TV. We'll catch you next time.